Good morning, South Florida, and welcome to this edition of WDNA's Frost Jazz Hour right here on WDNA's 88.9 FM, the home of serious jazz. I'm your host, Marcello Corelli, and uh, it's good to be back here after uh, quite a hectic end of 2020, and we're here for our first live show in 2021, and uh, quite a way to start off with the esteemed Martin Bejarano. Uh, you know, we had him on the show with the Stamps uh, Trio a few a few months back, uh, but now he's here doing some solo piano, and uh, we're so excited to have him here with us. He's worked with the likes of uh, people like Russell Malone, Christian McBride, Ignacio Barroja, uh, and so many more. He studied at the Florida State University and studied classical and jazz arranging, and then went on to FSU, and then went to study uh, on a full scholarship at UM. Uh, so, you know, he's been working with so many artists and has so much to share with you uh, musically, so we're going to get right to it and start it off with some music. Without further ado, Martin Bejarano. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, I wish we had a live audience for that one, but um, I hope a bunch of people were tuning in. That was incredible. Thank you. Thank you for, for both of those arrangements. And so, so um, for our viewers, what was the first, uh, what were those two pieces sure. you just played? So the first tune was uh, an original of mine uh, entitled B. Radley. It's kind of a, a little tribute to Brad Meldow, who's one of my favorite uh, pianists and also a very great composer. So uh, I was kind of inspired by him and, and his style a little bit on that one. And then, of course, the second one was a very famous composition by the great Herbie Hancock uh, entitled Dolphin Dance. Oh, yeah, that was great. And um, I was going to say about the first tune you played, I heard a lot of classical influence in the melody and just the way you arranged it and everything. And I know sure. you, you kind of were brought up with the, you know, classical piano training at you know, you know, FSU and, and studying with people like Bill Peterson, too, and, and yeah. all of that kind of coming together. I mean, so is that what you were thinking about like when you were writing this piece and arranging it? I was curious, how, you know, especially doing arranging on the spot, because that's what pianists do. Is they arrange on Sure. That's their job. So. Yeah. So, you know, um, definitely the kind of textural thing of, with that piece is, is a, has a very classical kind of uh, vibe to it, for sure. And even some of the harmony has a little bit of that uh, as well. I, I just really like that kind of a rolling piano style where, where the piano's uh, subdividing a lot of 16th notes, subdividing the accompaniment, which is, of course, something that Brad does really, really well. Um, and I, I kind of like the juxtaposition of something really busy in the accompaniment, but quiet, uh, then with a kind of a simple, you know, hopefully a pretty <laughs> melody uh, on top of it. Right, so, right. Yeah. It's it's amazing how like how much syncopation is going on in your left hand while you're kind of playing this beautiful melody on over the top of everything, and it just doesn't seem like anything's getting in the way. Yeah, you know, it's just it's it's pretty fascinating. Nobody it was tricky. I really had yeah. to. Uh, it's a lot of like the classical aspect of it too is just like kind of technically how it lands on the pianos where the hands share a lot of the duties. You know, so That's the right true. hand is taking some of those arpeggios and so on and so forth. So. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I heard some. I guess you said like the classical harmony influence. Some there were some sort of cadences in there, like yeah, maybe, you know Mozart influence kind of things, or I, yeah. I don't know what you would what you would call those. You know. Absolutely, yeah. I, I really love uh, I love classical music in general, but I really love uh, listening and playing to you know romantic and late romantic uh, composers, and definitely some of the harmonic um, kind of uh, progressions and ideas kind of steal a little bit from from that world for sure yeah 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 yeah, yeah. also um you know from your studies with bill peterson and um leon i'm i don't know if i'm going to say this correctly <laughs> leonidas lipo lipovetsky perfect but yeah anyways perfect. Yeah. yeah um from studying with those people and then other you know greats that you've been mentored by throughout you know what would you say for students watching and aspiring musicians was the best thing that you got out of your studies in school and you know through being at FSU or UM or, you know, what would you say is the, the most valuable? Um, I got a lot of, a lot of stuff uh, for sure. I owe those teachers so, so, so much. Um, but really, honestly, I think that the, and this goes with some of my mentors too, some of the older musicians that I've got to play with and things, the kind of, the, I think the biggest uh, influence on me or thing that really stuck with me is how dedicated they were to their instrument and to playing music. And that always uh, really impressed upon me um, qu quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, I, I would get off and go early to my lessons uh, with Bill Peterson and sit outside his door for, you know, half hour and eat a sandwich or something just so I could hear him practice, you know. And he was practicing all the time, you know, teaching full time, you know, living in Tallahassee, which you, there's gigs and stuff, but it's not like there's a lot of stuff happening musically, yeah. but he was so dedicated to his instrument and always learning and always trying to improve. Sure. And same thing with my, my classical teacher, same thing with Vince Mazio, who I studied with here at UM. Uh, and, and it just kind of like, it, 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 it was good because it, it showed me like, oh, okay, like I guess that's what it takes, you know, to try to get to that sure. level. So it, 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 really, it really stuck with me. Yeah, yeah, but that's certainly what you're doing. You can hear it. I mean, you're, the work that you put in, you know, at the same time as teaching all the, the students you have here. So you're, you're, bas you're following the footsteps of your mentors and trying, yeah, trying. Definitely hard. doing it. It's not easy. Doing it well. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. 
That's but cool. um, so I want to hear you play some more stuff cool. before we take a, a quick breather. Okay. So um, what do you got next for us? Uh, why don't I play some? I'll play some kind of different. This is a, a little arrangement of mine of uh, a Thelonious Monk composition called Reflections. Great, great.
right there. Wow. That was quite an arrangement of the Thelonious Monk tune entitled Reflections. Heard a lot of ragtime and stride and triplets and all kinds of cool stuff in there. But we're going to take a quick breather and we'll be right back in a few minutes right here on WDNA's 88.9 FM, the home of serious jazz. Hello again. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Frost Jazz Hour right here on WDNA's 88.9 FM. You can also actually watch this show, I believe, on WVUM. There's a an, uh, collaboration between uh, our station here and the station at, at the University of Miami. Thanks to Philip Capuzzi, a student at, at UM, um, for bass and cello, great, great musician. So you, you can, I believe, watch this show also on 90.5 FM, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But... Um, we're back here with Professor Martin Bejarano. He's the head of the uh, jazz piano department at the University of Miami. He has worked with people like Roy Haynes, Christian McBride, Ignacio Barroa, Russell Malone, and, and the list goes on and on. So, Martin, thanks again for being here with us and for bringing your great music to, to the stage here. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always, I always love coming here and playing at DNA, so thanks. Yeah, yeah, and they love having you, I'm sure. So, so um, I, you know... First off, because you've, you've played with so many artists over the years, um, you know, I wanted to, to ask if you maybe could name a single moment or a performance that have stu has stuck with you throughout your career. I mean, you, you know, there's so many probably moments you could name, but if there was one that's just that you could always have remembered it, you know, throughout your career, what would it be? Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, let me think. Um, well, probably... One that really really sticks out quite a bit is uh, was a concert with Roy Haynes Quartet. Um, maybe about I don't know two years after I started playing with the band, and it was a really wonderful show that was at um, um, uh, the Alice Tully Hall in Lincoln Center, yeah. which is a beautiful hall. I just moved to New York really about not even three years before that, and um, we played a set and then. Roy played a set with Chick Corea and um, maybe, I can't remember who the bass player was. Maybe it was Dave Holland, I, I'm, I don't remember. Mm. And um, my dad came up, uh, you know, from Miami, flew up and came to the concert. And I don't know, that just kind of felt like, you know, it, it felt like, okay, finally, like all these years of practicing and playing and working really hard, you know, it, it kind of culminated in, 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 in this thing and having my dad come up and, and be a part of a, a show like that. And, you know, both my parents had lived in New York City for a while before they moved uh, to Miami. And, I, you know, my mom was a big music lover, so she used to go to see concerts and operas and all the time. So I remember her talking about Lincoln Center and Alice Tully Hall and, uh, you know, all that stuff. So it kind of had a sentimental value to it, I think. It, plus, it was a great show, yeah. a wonderful hall to play and... Uh, it was just it was just a really something that always kind of sticks sticks in my mind. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, having the having your parents that have supported you throughout, oh, and, yeah. and be there with you in a moment when you know it was kind of a dream come true to play with yeah. somebody like Roy, and and you know it was all kind of coming together in the moment. That's that's I'm Absolutely. sure it must have been. Yeah, quite they sat a great through film. all the you know practicing <laughs> at home and yeah. you know rock band rehearsals in my garage and you know <laughs> or in my bedroom or whatever, and you know schlepping me to lessons and paying for them and you know uh slapping me to recitals and to all that stuff yeah. that parents do so it was it was a real nice uh, experience yeah no that's that's that's, that's and really... i got to meet chick Corea, which was kind of like <laughs> nice that was the first uh, time i got to meet him so that wasn't right. too bad either and you also got to trade courses with him i heard too right at one i point. did yeah that was that was kind of, maybe that's number two yeah on the list uh about a year or so after that um we did a gig. It was kind of a similar thing in uh, in Germany at this really great festival uh, called um, uh, man, what's the name of that? 
festival. Well, they, every year they, ch they would change the instruments. It was called On Drums. Uh, and and uh, I can't remember the, the actual name of the festival. But anyway, and we played a set again with the quartet. And then Chick came out as a special guest and played the rest of the show. Uh, but then at, at the end of the show, he was kind enough to have me come out with him and do like an encore. Oh, that's great. And so we got to trade courses on the blues, and it was uh, surreal, but also like just so much fun. Yeah, just, yeah. sure. And so. I hear, I mean, both of you guys could play drums, so you could even switch off and like play different instruments or something at one, because I know. Well, that both, would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe another, maybe next time. You yeah, know, yeah. I'll, do I'm down for that anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Also, uh, yeah, so you, you uh, also have been touring with uh, Russell Malone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, I toured uh, with Russell for almost nine years. Wow. Actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I've heard Russell. He's just such a sweet guy, sweet player. Um, and uh, I was wondering, you know, because often it's very difficult when pianists and guitarists are, are working together and figuring yeah. out when to, to not step on each other's toes and comp together. So I was curious what that was, has been like and what you've learned from, from playing with Russ, you know, over the years about how to be more sensitive and, I mean, and, and work on that, you know, work on interacting yeah. with one another. It's a great question. And, and, like, to be honest, I had never really played that much with a guitar player before, you know. That kind of wasn't very common back then too much. Um, uh, in the music that I, that I was playing. Uh, so Russell's a great guy and a, a ridiculous musician and a, um, a great band leader. And what was really great about him was that, you know, I would say most of the time, you know, but <laughs> most of the time, he, if he had something to say or like, hey, why don't you, could you do this or something? He was always so respectful and cool and relaxed you know, that it made, it made it easier for me to like, you know, uh, to, to kind of not get worked up about it or nervous about, oh, am I gonna play a chord and he's gonna play a chord and it's not gonna work or something like that. So he was very cool about that thing and he, he, wasn't, he wasn't too like, what's a good word, like, create, like he wasn't too like strict or something about that. Sure. He's sure. like, yeah, just play, like we're gonna figure it out. You know, if something doesn't work, we'll, you know, so that environment, man, that's like, that's the best for, to, to be in a band uh, with that. I mean, don't get me wrong, like, we had to play the music a certain way, and mm -hmm. obviously, but as far as that uh, aspect, uh, it was pretty cool. And it really just came to a point of just listening really hard, which is something that, you know, as we talked about in, in when we, I worked with your wonderful group last yeah. semester and with other groups in the school, it's like, it really always boils down to listening. Seriously. Listening and reacting and making choices based on what's happening around you not what you maybe usually would play or typically would play or are comfortable with playing. So it really meant kind of, uh, you know, being able to play things that I would usually play a certain way and change them and play in a very different way so that it would work with the two uh, chordal instruments. Sure. He was also really cool because he didn't have a real ego about like, I'm gonna comp, you know, you know or I'm gonna be the comper or whatever. It was just kind of like very relaxed and it happened very naturally. So. Yeah, no, that's the, and, you know, that yeah. all comes from the trust within the band too. And, and that's you know, right. Russ knows yeah. that you know, hiring you or getting you to play in his band, you know, he knew that that was what he was going to be dealing with. Like a lot of just, yeah. he was, you know, a lot of trust, and he well, knew that, you knew what you were doing. And he's also a very tasteful player himself. And yeah. So I'm sure it all came together really, really nicely. And, and well, it's why it's so important. You know, it's something that you know, another thing that gets talked about in school a lot that I'm sure gets very old to hear it, but it's so important. It's just being prepared and ready to go. Because I think when you're prepared and you are you know what you're doing and you come into the gig and you're solid and everything is cool and you did the work, that's when you get the trust. That's right. You know, if you don't have that, eh, it's a little bit harder to earn that trust. Uh, so. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, preparation is key, but also sacrificing certain things in your playing, yeah. like you said, like, you know, doing stuff differently to serve the music well and Absolutely. to listen to others. And you, know. and, you know, everyone has a different opinion, too. Like, you know, I've been lucky enough to play uh, in Roy's group with Pat Metheny on many occasions where he plays as a guest. And, you know, he has a, a very specific way that he likes the piano to work with him. And that's cool. Yeah. You know, that's great. Pat Metheny, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so, but he told me, like, right up front, you know, hey, you know what, if it's cool, like, and again, in a very nice way, I, I kind of like to do this with the piano, if you, if you don't mind doing this, you know, mm -hmm. and I said, well, absolutely, of course, and then it made, it made, it took the guesswork out of it, which is very nice, mm -hmm. you know, or, or else I'd be playing the whole time kind of thinking, like, am I comping too much, or am I playing, you know, am I not giving, you know, 
So having that kind of very specific, you know, uh, not rules, but whatever you want to call them, was, was very helpful because it, it, it put me in a position where, okay, I know what I have to do, and then, and then it's going to be fine. Yeah. So everyone's a little different. Sure. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Great answers. Um, let's hear you play some more music. That's the main thing. That's why we're here, to hear you play. So, yeah, maybe play another tune for us. What, what, what do you have in, in mind? Um, I'll play, um, let's see. I'll play an, another original of mine. I'll kind of bring, the, bring it a little slower. Uh, this is a tune that, uh, speaking of my dad, I wrote this tune for my dad. Uh, right. shortly after he passed away, um, call, and this tune is called Last Happy Hour. And he was, uh, he had this little thing where, you know, like about 5.30, he'd be like, oh, it's happy hour time, you know, and he'd fix his little beverage <laughs> yeah. to drink. So uh, this one's for my dad. It's called Last Happy Hour. All right, take it away.
Wow. Beautiful tune. Incredible. Um, yeah, I heard a lot of uh, just the way the dynamics you used in that. I just really ad admire mm. that. And uh, it kind of reminded me of, uh, I know, a big influence of yours, um, Keith Jarrett. Yeah, and just listening I, to him on the way up here, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, so I, I just uh, was wondering, um, you know, because of the admiration you have for him, you know, what is because I know he also, I know the last tune you're going to play may, may or may not be a standard, but mm -hmm. um, Keith Jarrett did a lot of playing of jazz standards. He stopped composing, you know, yeah. pretty, pretty early compared to most musicians. And uh, so, what, how is his way of playing standards influenced your way of, of arranging, you know, not just standards, but anything you, you play? You know, um, there's two, maybe, there's a lot of things about Keith to like, of course, but maybe the two things that stand out the most, uh, and this goes for his standard playing and anything, really. Um, one is his uh, kind of like fearlessness as an improviser, you know. Um, his, uh, I, I play, I went the jazz route, you know, rather than maybe going a different route in music because of the improvisational aspect, because I just, I love it so much. And it, it, you get a certain feeling from that that you don't get from other music. Um, and, you know, some players, uh, there's all different kinds of improvisers and all different kinds of players. And some people, you know, play, uh, maybe improvise uh, and solo and, and, and kind of like, I don't know how to say this with a, in a politically correct way, but you know, kind of have a certain thing that they play, yeah. you know, and then they, they, they come to the stage and they play it and it's amazing and incredible and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But I'm very drawn to Keith's approach, which is kind of like, uh, what, let's just see what happens and let's just go for it. And, you know, it's, it's reflected in his trio, you know, um, which unfortunately is not playing anymore, but um, in, the, in the way that they just did not rehearse, ever, not one rehearsal in 30 years of playing. Uh, they would meet, I think, the night before or something, have dinner, talk about the tunes, maybe say, hey, do you play an A-flat on that or do you play this, you know? Um, and then there was no discussion of, like, how we're going to play the standard or we're going to do this tempo or that. They would just start playing. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, was like, I was already drawn to that already, and then when those guys came out and, and did that, I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is exactly what I, what I want, would want, you know? Yeah. And that's why so many people copied them <laughs> after that, because they kind of like opened the door to that. Hey, man, we've heard Autumn Leaves quite a bit. You know, mm. we don't have to talk about it. We can just if we're all great musicians and listening, going back to the listening thing, and we're on the same page. And, you know, it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great experience. I remember reading that yeah. Gary Peacock, when Keith called him up about doing this, he thought he was kidding. He's like, standards trio? Really? Like, that's the last thing he ever expected Keith was going to do. And of course, Keith takes this into his free improvisation solo piano concerts as well, where he just gets up and mm -hmm. improvises um, for two hours or something, right. which sounds like, oh, that's cool because you don't have to memorize any music or whatever, but it is not cool at all. It's very difficult, you know, to do it at the level that he does it as well. So that's the, that kind of, his approach to improvising and, the, and the, the emotional quality that happens, I think, because of it is really stands out. Um, the other thing about Keith is just his, his control of the instrument is, uh, it's incredible, yeah. you know. There's a lot of pianists that have a lot of chops, you know, and a lot of technique, of course, a lot of wonderful pianists. Um, but to me, it's very hard to think of many more pianists, uh, too many more, that have the breadth of control mm -hmm. and taste, you know, yeah. to use those chops and, and in a way where, where dynamics and <laughs> phrasing and all those things that are mu the, the musical aspects of playing, not like scales and notes and fast or slow or triplets or double time, but those things are always like in the forefront, you know. Um, so that's something I really tried very hard. It's not easy all the time, but I really tried very hard to kind of like uh, follow that way of thinking in, in, in my playing, you know, kind of go for it on the improvisation tip and always have, you know, things like dynamics, expression, and all the things that are involved in playing that at, at at the very top of, of what my focus is. So it doesn't yeah. always happen, but. That's, that's a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, for anybody who's, who's listening, you know, 
just remember those things to, to really not be afraid to go for something and, and do something kind of ad lib, you know, that's what jazz is. It's like, you can't, yeah. you know, you can only rehearse so much. And sometimes it's like you over rehearse and then it can just yeah. cause a lot of issues and a lot of overthinking and, and yeah, just, you know, ha just being in the moment and going for things and trying new things out with the band and, you know, again, the trust thing and the, it's, it's all, yeah. but yeah. And, and also focusing on like, like you said, dynamics and just the beauty of, of the way, like, you know, you can, you, the facility that you can have on the instrument, but also being willing to, to sacrifice that for, for taste and for, you know, other right. things, you know, yeah. so. And then, you know, sometimes playing the loudest, fastest thing you can is, is that's what's called for. And that's, sure. yeah, exactly. and that's cool, you know, but just kind of having that hyper awareness and, and being able to, again, the listening thing is what, to me, what it always comes back to, just listening and being aware of like what seems to be right for the music at that point. You're yeah. not always going to make the right choice, but at least you're trying. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, we got time for we definitely play one more uh, to, to close out the show. Um, maybe we're going over time. I'm not sure, but I definitely, you know, regardless, want to hear you play one more. Um, I, I heard maybe you might be playing Arigen. Is that is that going to happen? I'd love to. Yeah, hear I'll give it a stab. Uh, this arrangement I did on my last trio record, uh, you know, for trio, and I've been trying to kind of play it uh, solo piano. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right, here's Arigen, arranged by Martin Bejarano, right here on WDNA's 88.9. FM and before he he plays just want to uh, let you guys know that next week we will have the Eric Stern trio one of uh, Martin's uh, you know esteemed students and then the week after we'll have uh, uh, WDNA's very own Philip Capuzzi and his group and many more so without further ado one more tune here from the great Martin Bejarano Arigen <laughs> Thank you. 